Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, it gives me great pleasure to respond to this bill on behalf of the opposition uh, in its second outing uh, in the Commons uh, again. Um, our, fish our fishers risk their lives every day to bring home food for us all. It's not a profession that comes without risk. I would like to join the Secretary of State in taking a moment to remember those six fishers who didn't come back after their trips to sea last year. Fishing matters to me. It matters to the people of Plymouth, who I represent, with a thousand jobs in the city, and to coastal communities across our four nations. Fishing is knitted into our national identities and our culture, our local flavours and, of course, our coastal economies. Recreational fishing, now larger than commercial fishing in GDP terms, matters to even more people. Labour will be supporting this bill. In a moment, I'll come back to you. Um, Labour will be supporting this bill, defending the enhancements made in the Lords and proposing further necessary provisions. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way on that point. And just uh, recreational fishing, it touches on a good point. We all see, receive representations, I think, from the Angling Trust. But with the pandemic, with more staycations, the opportunity for sea angling to bring real benefits to our coastal communities is crystal clear. Does he agree with that? I thank your member for that, and I do agree with him. I think the, there is a real opportunity in the waters around the southwest for a catch and release bluefin tuna fishery, for instance. It's a shame that DEFRA didn't quite agree with me on that one. And certainly in support of the charter boat sector that have been denied much of the support that they should have had throughout the coronavirus, I think there is a real case for more support for them. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, fishing is a policy area where up to now sound bites have often triumphed over substance and where dogma has often won out over detail. That must end now because fishers in our coastal communities cannot feed their families on sound bites and vague government promises. Fishing needs to be more sustainable, both economically and environmentally. We need not only a fishing net zero approach, better management of lost fishing gear to stem the plastic pollution it causes. We need replacement plans for dirty diesel engines, and we need better science to inform better quota decisions to protect fish stocks and jobs. Fishing needs a strategy to widen employment, to make fishing a career of choice for more young people in our coastal communities. New methods and quota allocation to encourage new entrants and a firm focus on viability and sustainability. We know that coronavirus has hit fishers hard. Closure and disruption of export markets, throttling of imports, closure of restaurants and cafes, and a huge drop in prices made going to sea unprofitable for many of our fishers. The help for fishers that Labour argued for eventually came, but took too long to come, and sadly excludes some of the most innovative projects, like the brilliant Call for Fish initiative that the Secretary of State knows because I've spoken to him about. DEFRA needs to learn the lessons here to look again at how they raided fishery support uh, funding pots to pay for these schemes and what the cost of the industry will be in long term of those pots having been raided. Madam Deputy Speaker, just as fish do not respect national boundaries, so our fishing sector is cross-border too. I support the move to zonal attachment from relative stability. That is an outdated method and I, uh, and I think there is a real case for that change. We import two-thirds of the fish we eat, and we export two-thirds of the fish we catch. We don't eat enough locally caught fish, and our diets are, have been calibrated over decades to eat what is caught around Iceland and, Mo and Norway more than the wondrous ocean harvest of our own waters, and I think we need to change that. That's why there can be no, de no new delays at the border, no new burdensome customs checks, no new expensive government red tape in implementing these and in any future trade deals. We need to make sure that we can import and export, but celebrate the fish in our own waters more as well. Just. My right, the right honourable gentleman seems to be promoting a link between a trade deal and the, the, the share and access to our waters. Is that what he's actually saying? Well, I, th I thank my neighbour for this. And I know it's a point that she raises frequently. I think that's probably a point you need to raise with the government uh, more than with, uh, with the opposition bench here. What we do want to see is our fishers support it. And I do want to make sure that fishers get a greater share and a fairer share of quota available to them. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, compared to the last version of legislation, thankfully this bill has been much improved in part by ministers adopting many of the amendments that Labour proposed in Bill Committee at the first attempt the Government took to get this bill through. 
I'm glad ministers took the time to reflect on their decisions when they voted down those Labour amendments, and I'm glad this bill includes as much pollard as it does pollock this time round. <laughs> I think it's a good demonstration of constructive opposition. I'm sure we can agree. Uh, but I also want to note the improvements to the bill that was passed by the Lords and to thank in particular Baroness Jones of Whitchurch for her efforts in the other place. The question now, which the Secretary of State has answered, is whether he will see fit to accept those amendments that improve the bill. It is sad that he is choosing to reject, especially the sustainability amendments and those that would generate more jobs in our coastal communities. Happy to for the last question. Does the I, I respect the Honourable Gentleman greatly and he knows that, but does he not accept uh, that the, the fishing sector wants a sustainable industry for the future as well? And to have that you need to have the cooperation of the fishing sector. And that, those amendments that's coming from the House of Lords, they don't want them. Well, I, th I thank the Honourable Member for that mention. I think, I think he's choosing to call the fishing sector one single sector, whereas he knows, as well as I do, that the fishing sector is multiple sectors with different catches, different gears, different fishing approaches in different parts of our coastal waters. And not all fishers share the view that he has uh, uh, done there because they have told me accordingly. Uh, I'll make some progress before I take any further interventions. Um, Madam Deputy, this bill is a framework bill, so it's necessarily light on detail. Um, but it does offer a centralisation of powers with the, uh, with the Secretary of State and doesn't deliver the coastal renaissance that I think this bill should have done. <laughs> Ten years of austerity has hit our coastal communities hard. And now COVID-19 means we are standing on the precipice of a new jobs crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1980s. Decline of fishing ports is the story told the nation over, but it doesn't have to be this way. Even before we see if the promises of more fish from the government will be delivered or not, more jobs could be created if ministers use the powers they already have. I believe in British fishing. Growing the fleet, making fishing more sustainable and creating more jobs can all happen with improvements to this bill. Now let me turn to the Jobs in Coastal Communities Amendment, uh, Clause 18 in the bill that the Secretary of State says he uh, wishes to remove. I believe if you catch fish under a British quota, Britain should benefit from that fish in terms of jobs and trade. I want to back our British ports to create more jobs and land more fish in Britain. Labour's Jobs in Coastal Communities amendment that passed with cross-party support in the Lords would establish a new national landing requirement where two-thirds of fish caught under a UK quota must be landed in UK ports. That would mean more jobs created in Grimsby, Plymouth, New Lynn, Port of Ogie, Brixham and Fleetwood to name but a few. There are 10 jobs on land for every one job at sea. In just a moment, there are 10 jobs on land for every one job at sea. So landing more fish in Britain is a jobs multiplier. Happy giving way, I think it's there. And then I'll, that's my last. Uh, would my right honourable friend uh, agree that actually um, in, in making essential that you have to land your fish in the UK is actually detrimental to the industry because the industry, the UK fishers, need to be able to land where they will get the better price? Well, I, I hear that argument, and I also hear it's not in support of those British ports where landing more fish could create more jobs. And I think we need to think about what is that benefit that will be gained from leaving the common fisheries policy. If there is an argument to only support fishers, uh, fish caught under a UK quota landed in foreign ports, creating jobs in foreign ports, that's an argument that the Honourable Member is free to make, but it's not one that we made from this side of the House. Uh, Labour's Jobs uh, in Coastal Communities Amendment uh, is designed to ensure that whether the boat is Dutch, Spanish, French, actually British or just flagged that way, boats fishing under a UK quota would be required to land the majority of their fish in British ports. This would create a jobs boom in these for fish markets, for processors, for fuel sellers, for boat repairers and for distributors. With the virus, the recession, austerity's consequences, couldn't our coastal communities do with more jobs? I hope that the other side will agree with that and not continue the support for fish being landed in foreign ports, not creating jobs in our communities. I'm going to make some progress because I've, I've gone for some time. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, the backbone of British fishing is our small boat fleet. And these boats and businesses are the ones that the British public want to see benefit most from our exit from the common fisheries policy. While industrial fishing has its place, I make no apology for wanting a fairer share for our small fishers. With just 6% of the quota, the small boat fleet has two-thirds of the jobs, and I think it could have more. 
Reallocating quota along social, economic and environmental grounds, even if just 1% or 2% of the total catch were to be reallocated, could increase uh, what small boats could catch by 25%. This is the second jobs multiplier that Labour has proposed in this bill. This would be huge for our small boat fleet, helping, them, uh, helping give them a platform to invest in new gear, boats and hire more crew. This rebalancing could easily be absorbed by the big foreign-owned boat operators within their current range of variation of total allowable catch. Yet this is the policy yet again opposed by the party opposite. I know the largest fishing companies, mostly foreign-owned, are strong supporters of the Conservative Party, but to borrow a phrase, uh, Labour's policy is for the many fishers, not the few. I hope the Tory MPs won't be looking at their feet as the whips demand total loyalty to Downing Street and require them to vote this amendment down when the time comes. Because our fishing communities need a strong voice in Westminster, not just more whips instructions at the expense of coastal towns. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, Labour will also be tabling an amendment to ban super trawlers pillaging Britain's marine protected areas. The Greenpeace campaign on this issue has attracted signatures of a number of ministers, but sadly not a single DEFRA minister. Labour will table an amendment to ban super trawlers over 100 metres fishing in marine protected areas. Britain has not one super trawler over 100 metres. So ministers and those opposite have an easy choice to decide whether they're on the side of British fishers or foreign-owned industrial super trawlers harvesting huge quantities of fish, plundering those very habitats Britain regards as special. I hope that would be an easy decision, but we'll have to see. Uh, honestly, for the last time, I'll give my... Uh, allowing me to intervene. Uh, my understanding was that the Minister, the Secretary of State, has already said yeah, that yeah. the whole purpose of this bill is to ban super trawlers because super trawlers are actually allowed under EU law, yeah. not laws that we want yeah. to introduce. Yeah. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for that. I'm not sure that is the main purpose of the bill, uh, but certainly it is the power that I believe the Secretary of State already has. And one of the key things about the amendments that Labour has proposed in, uh, for this bill is that these are using powers that the Minister already has. Whether there is more fish from any negotiations with the EU in the future, these are powers that the UK government, the Conservative government, could use today if they choose to. They don't need to wait till after the 31st of December. They don't need to wait for the passing of this bill. And it is in requiring them to use the powers that they have so chosen not to use that we are making the case for it. Because I think there is a good case for banning super trawlers over 100 metres from fishing in marine protected areas. I believe ministers should have acted already. And I believe there is an opportunity to put that in law in this bit here. Um, I'm going to make some progress because I only have limited time. And I don't want to take up the time of people at the end of the uh, call list. Apologies. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, on safety, progress is being made towards making fishing safer. But much work still needs to be done. I want to see fishers wearing life jackets all the time that come as standard with personal locator beacons that take the search out of search and rescue when boats go down or fishers are washed overboard. I want more work on stability, especially for our smaller boats when they change gear in particular. Remote vessel monitoring and CCTV on board, another amendment one in the Lords, helps ensure fishing stays within the law, but also will incentivise fishers to wear a life jacket and come home safely to their families after each trip. I know that this is a cross-party concern, and I commit Labour to working constructively to help save more lives, as we have in recent years. Uh, just, OK. I endorse what he says with regard to safety at sea. But there is another aspect of this that has become apparent to me recently through the activities of the Persorsa Dos, a Spanish gill netter, which was quite reckless in its conduct off the, the shores of Shetland recently, endangering the lives of the crew of the Alison Kay. That was something which the MCA in this country was powerless to investigate because it happened outside the 12-mile limit. Does the honourable gentleman agree with me, and will he support in committee moves to extend the jurisdiction of the MCA to the 200-mile limit? Well, I thank the honourable member, and I recall in the last Fisheries Bill Committee making the case that foreign boats in UK waters should be adhering to the same safety standards as UK boats, and I think that is an argument that we can again pick up at Bill Committee uh, this time round. Um, I also want to briefly just make the case uh, uh, to ask whether. Uh, to look at, in particular, the uh, quota uh, allocations. Now, in support of um, uh, zonal attachment rather than uh, relative stability, uh, we need to recognise that there is a, a real complex case here 
There are fissures with complex historical uh, uh, catch records that need to be draw, uh, looked at, and that's why we need to make a clear case about how fishing quota will change over time. Labour's proposed a phased drawdown period, not a rush to reallocate quota uh, in terms of the way. That would give British fishers the chance to invest in new gear and recruitment, as well as giving time, if there is transfer from our EU friends, for potentially those boats to be decommissioned and the workers retrained. Allocating quota in contested waters, where there are fishing records as complex, uh, is difficult, and uh, that is an area that will require careful negotiation with our EU friends. But I also want to flag with the Minister that British fishing also needs continued access to distant waters uh, to preserve current activities, because not all British fishers fish in British waters, and that is worth noting. Um, very briefly, because I realise my time is running out, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, to achieve any of these grand promises made to fishing, and not just the ones that have already been broken by ministers, like the solemn pledge that fishing would not be in the transition period, if we recall that one, we need ministers to keep to their word and stick to their timetables. Today, the government is a whole two months late on the new, on the new fisheries agreement. It was meant to be concluded by 1st of July, according to their boasts of their so-called oven-ready deal. We know that the government thinks there are serious concerns, and I quote, about the illegal fishing, border violations, violent disputes and blockading of ports in the event of no deal. What additional resources has the Minister discussed with the Ministry of Defence for allocating to the Royal Navy to protect our fishers, and why is there nothing in this bill to express the concerns around enforcement? I want to see more fish landed in British ports, more of it processed here and more of it eaten here. I encourage members to set an example by buying, eating and promoting local fish. Can the Minister tell the House whether zero tariffs will continue to apply to those imported fish from Iceland, Norway and the Faroes? If so, what additional support will be given to our own domestic industry? What are the Government's plans to incentivise processors to process more UK caught fish? Uh, and how will they encourage the biggest players, perhaps, in this, the supermarkets, to put more British fish on their shelves? I would like to see Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, M&S, Waitrose, Asda, Lidl, Aldi and the Co-op sell more British fish. I read their names out deliberately because I would like them to write to MPs to set out how they will sell more British fish, because that is a decision that they can take. We don't need ministers to take it for them. That can be done by supermarkets, and there is a case for doing that. Um, Labour will be again supporting this bill uh, while proposing and defending the necessary improvements. Uh, it's a shame that the SNP are playing politics with this bill with their amendments, however, today. Mock constitutional outrage will not feed the families of Fishers in Peterhead or Fraserburgh, nor does blocking this bill at this stage help put in place the legal certainty necessary after the 31st of December. I say to the SNP, uh, this government is quite capable of messing this up all by themselves. They don't need the SNP's help uh, with their amendment tonight. Uh, and for that reason, Labour MPs won't be backing this, uh, th their, their amendment uh, this evening. Um, to conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the fishers I represent in Plymouth and to those I speak for in my role in the Shadow Cabinet, the fish processors, the distributors, the merchants, the chefs and scientists, we need a fisheries bill that is focused on sustainability, on viability and on a better future for our coastal communities than we have seen certainly for the last decade. We will not be opposing this bill tonight, but we will be arguing strongly to defend the improvements made to this bill in the Lords, to insert a new focus on creating jobs in fishing and to ensure that fishing is truly sustainable. Thank you.